So let's take a look at a poem that we started with last week, with some of you anyway. This is called Late Summer by Jennifer Gratz, born in 1971. This was originally published in 2011, so it's a very recent poem. And I wanted to share with you a couple things about um, writing poetry and then reading it, of course, as the audience. We often talk about sound devices like alliteration and assonance, but we don't often connect it with meaning, and that's something I think that's important for us to do at this point in um, what it is that we're trying to learn about poetry. I think we can take it to the next step. So as we look at this poem, we're going to see several, several occasions where the poet intentionally uses the repetition of sounds in order to reinforce an idea. And that can be difficult to recognize unless you've seen how it happens in an example like this one. So first let's read a little bit of the poem out loud. Before the moths have even appeared to orbit around them, the street lamps come on, a long row of them glowing uselessly. Along the ring of garden that circles the city center, where your steps count down the dulling of daylight. At your feet, a bee crawls in small circles, like a toy unwinding. Summer specializes in time, slows it down almost to a dream. And the noisy day goes so quiet you can hear the bedraggled man who visits each trash receptacle. Now one thing I think you probably heard in that is the repetition of the S sound. Sometimes it's represented by a C, circles the city center, and sometimes it's an S, small in the phrase small circles. Summer specializes. So we're listening for that S sound and what it does. Now the S sound itself doesn't mean anything all by itself, but within the context of the poem we start to see how that S sound is used to get us to not only hear something, but to see something too. The main image in the first stanza are the street lamps and the moths. And the, street, the, the street lamps have come on before the moths have even appeared. So they are glowing, but they're useless. They're just there. Then we have these phrases like, circles the city center. Well, that S sound is repeated like concentric circles. If you draw a series of circles on a piece of paper that gets smaller and smaller, that's like the light that comes out from a street lamp. Light doesn't go out in a square, it goes out in a circle. So the image of the light coming on, even though at this point it's glowing uselessly, these lamps are part of this ring of the garden that is a circle. And the repetition of that sound reminds us of those concentric circles of light. Is that reinforced anywhere else in the poem? Look at the third line of the second stanza. At your feet, a bee crawls in small circles like a toy unwinding. Is this really what the poet meant to do, Noller? Gee, I don't know. But when I look at this poem and I see the repetition of that S sound, and then I see it repeated again in the phrase small circles, it feels to me like the poet is saying, hey, this was on purpose. Do you see what I see? Because this poem isn't just about a bee and street lamps. It's about the image. Summer specializes in time, slows it down almost to a dream. Well, how does time move? We think of time, we think of clocks, clocks that run in a circle. Time is cyclical itself. It runs in a circle. Um... The morning leads on to the evening, which leads on to morning, which leads on to evening, which leads on till morning. So, the image of the circle is a common image already in this poem. And that's reinforced 
by the repetition of sound attached in two places in the second stanza to the word circles. Along the ring of garden that circles the city center where your steps count down the dulling of daylight at your feet, a bee crawls in small circles like a toy unwinding. Summer specializes in time, slows it down almost to dream. So we're given to notice that sound and then ask what might it mean. Can we read the poem and appreciate it without getting down to the nitty gritty of the sounds? Sure we can. But it's also interesting to look at how <laughs> Sorry about that. It's also interesting to look at how the poet has intentionally used sound to create something beyond sound itself. Let's keep going. So here we have our bedraggled man. I'm going to back up uh, to the beginning of the sentence. And the noisy day goes so quiet you can hear the bedraggled man who visits each trash receptacle mutter in disbelief. Everything in the world is being thrown away. Summer lingers, but it's about ending. It's about how things redden and ripen and burst and come down. It's when city workers cut down trees, demolishing one limb at a time, spilling the crumbs of twigs and leaves all over the tablecloth of street. Sunglasses, the man softly exclaims, while behind him blooms a large gray rose of pigeons huddled around a dropped piece of bread. Okay, that's the whole thing. Next are the questions, right? Does anything in that section reinforce the concept of cycles or circles? I would suggest that it does. Pause the video for a minute if you don't have an idea of where you think there might be a cycle or a circle in this section. Pause the video and see if you can find something that you think might be meaningful there. Unpause it when you're ready to come back. Okay, you're back. Did you find it? Not like there's one right answer, but there's a couple right answers at least. Everything in the world is being thrown away. That which was new is being tossed away as garbage. Yet the bedraggled man finds treats like the sunglasses that he discovers in the garbage. That which is garbage has become new again. Yeah, but Noller, I mean, that's just a guy finding trash. Okay. What's the other central image in the last part of this poem? The seasons. We're talking about summer. We're talking about the summer lingering, but it's about to end. And what happens after the end of summer? the fall, when things redden and ripen and burst and come down. And what happens after fall? Winter. Winter, spring. Spring, summer. The seasons themselves, even just one mentioned on its own as something that's about to end, suggests all of the rest, another cycle. I would argue that this poem is full of circles and cycles. And some of it is reinforced by the sounds that the poet has chosen to use. Now let me go back and address one last sound device that we see. And it's the sound of the D. Back here in the second stanza. Along... The, the street lamps have come on and they're glowing, glowing uselessly around the ring of garden that circles the city center while your steps count down the dulling of daylight. Down the dulling of daylight. That D sound, when you say this out loud, the D sound slows us down. Certain sounds in English take longer to say than other sounds. The S sound can simply be repeated. S that's a bunch of S's. D's go like this. D -d 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 Certain sounds slow us down intentionally. When the sunlight is fading, the dulling of daylight, those sounds 
make us read more slowly. Now, can you be just obstinate and say, I can say that fast, count down the dulling of daylight? Sure you can, but that's not how anyone would ever read this poem. Not if they're doing any justice to the poem itself. So I'm not suggesting that the human voice is incapable of reading them slowly, but rather that when we read this with intention, those sounds do automatically slow us down. I don't know if you can hear my daughter practicing saxophone in the basement. If you can, sorry about the noise. Let's look further on to see how this works again um, with other sounds. It's towards the end here. It's when city workers cut down trees, demolishing one limb at a time, spilling the crumbs of twigs and leaves all over the tablecloth of street. There's, <laughs> there's a lot going on there in terms of trying to make a shift from one sound to another. Cut down trees. You have to completely reset how you're enunciating the words to get from down to trees. It's a completely different way of moving your mouth to make those sounds. Poets take advantage of that because they want you to slow down for things. Summer's lingering, but it's about ending. How does she show that it's lingering? By making you slow down with the sounds. City workers cut down trees, demolishing one limb at a time, spilling the crumbs of twigs and leaves all over the tablecloth of street. We're supposed to hear that slowly. Because we would say it slowly. It's not something we can breeze through if we're going to recite the poem honestly. And then let's look at the last stanza and check pace. Sunglasses, the man softly exclaims, while beside him blooms a large gray rose of pigeons huddled around a dropped piece of bread. Getting from dropped to piece slows us down. The large gray rows of pigeons, there's nothing that stops us there. But when we get to huddled around a dropped piece of bread, yeah, we have to slow down. We have to pause. So the sound in here, not only the alliteration, like small circles, circle city center, down dulling daylight, that repetition of consonant sounds, those mean something. But we should also get hints from the pace at which we are supposed to read the poem, which is suggested by the words and the sounds of the words that the poet has chosen. Now, there are some of you who are going to think this is crazy, who are going to think that I'm making this up, or who are just for the sake of argument going to just deny any of this. That's fine. But this is how poets read poetry. You're not all poets, I understand that. You're not all interested in poetry, I understand that. But let's take a glimpse into their vision and see if we can at least see what they see and hear what they hear, even if it's only a glimpse. <laughs> 